Welcome to From His Heart, where today Pastor Jeff Shreve continues his new series entitled Fake News, Exposing the Lies of the Devil. In today's message, he'll reveal the demonic lie that imprisons more people than any other. Join Pastor Jeff today to learn the world's most believed lie. How many people in this room have been to the doctor or the hospital in the last six months? Anybody been to the doctor or the hospital in the last six months? Yes. Most of us uh, go to the doctor, maybe too regularly, but we go a lot. We go for all sorts of things. Modern medicine is amazing. And it's just amazing that the things our doctors can do today. It's amazing with the breakthroughs that we've had, the surgeries that can be performed, things that used to lay people up for months now, you stay in the hospital, maybe it's not even an overnight stay, maybe it's just day surgery and they get you going. You know, uh, we really are living in a great time as far as medical advancements, but years ago, the medical community believed some pretty crazy things. The conventional wisdom of the day could be pretty insane. How about this ad that was in the paper in the early 1900s? Stedman's powders, in use for over 50 years. It's for children cutting teeth. You know what was in Stedman's powders? Mercury and morphine. Rub that on your kid's teeth and see what happens. Uh, they thought that was good for them. They thought mercury was something good for people. I mean, they gave it to people that had syphilis. They gave it to people that had cuts and scrapes and bruises. Hey, rub a little mercury on that. Well, we know that mercury is a poison, and you wouldn't do that. And then something that has been around for thousands of years is it, it, it is coined by, or the, the practice was dated all the way back to Hippocrates, who lived in the 300s BC. And he was the guy that came up with the four fluids uh, theory of medicine. You know, you had four fluids, you had yellow bile, you had black bile, you had phlegm and you had blood. And those four fluids needed to be in balance. And if they weren't in balance, well, this is what you did for it. You had a bloodletting. And so many people would go to the doctor and that's what they would do for them. Did you know that George Washington, the father of our country, the first president, I was thinking about that today, my nephew when he was young, my sister asked him, uh, Jeremy, who is the father of our country? He said, hmm, she said, George, he said, Jetson. And it wasn't George Jetson, <laughs> George Washington. He got a cold in December of 1799 and uh, thought, well, I'll just work through it and uh, woke up the next morning, early in the morning, and he could barely swallow, probably had strep throat, called the doctor. The doctor began to do a bloodletting, and within 12 hours, they had taken from George Washington 80 ounces of blood, about half his blood. And you know what happened? He died. He died from the strep throat, no, from the bloodletting. But that was conventional wisdom. That's what they said we need to do to make people better. Now, they believed that which was false. We're in a series today called Fake News, Exposing the Lies of the Devil. And today we want to talk about the world's most believed lie. It's the lie that's been around since Genesis chapter 4, since Cain and Abel it's the lie that the devil pumps out there that billions and billions of people have believed, that billions of bi and billions of people today do believe. It's a lie that is dangerous, that is destructive, that is damnable, a lie that will send your soul 
to hell forever and ever and ever. What is the world's most believed lie? That a person is saved in part or in all by his or her good works. That works is the way that you get to heaven. Maybe it's not all your works, but definitely your works figure into the equation, and that's the base of every false religion. It's a religion of works. It's the base of every false cult. You know, a false cult is a a group that claims to believe in Jesus, but they believe in another Jesus whom we have not preached, and really when you boil it down, it's all just a religion based on works. I love the little poem that says, I cannot work my soul to save that work my Lord has done, but I will work like any slave for the love of God's dear son. You and I are not saved by works. No one is ever saved by works, yet people still believe that. And people who come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, no doubt there are some of you in here today watching on television, on live stream, listening on radio, you deep down believe that you're saved by your good works. And uh, the the idea that God is somehow like Santa Claus, that one day you're going to stand before God and he's got this great big scale in heaven. And what does God do? He takes all your bad works and he puts them on one side of the scale and all your good works and he puts them on another side of the scale. And then you wait to see, do my good works outweigh my bad works? Because if my good works outweigh my bad works, then I get to go to heaven. But if my bad works outweigh my good works, then what happens? Sorry, Charlie, you didn't make it. You don't pass go, you don't collect $200. You are in hell forever. That's the way people see salvation. So many people see it that way, but it's not that way at all. And I pray that you would listen extra close because this message is so critical and it's so foundational and it's so fundamental because it's the message and the subject matter that determines heaven or hell. Acts chapter 16, I will use this story with Paul and Silas and the Philippian jailer as our text for today. If you know anything about Acts chapter 16, you know Paul and Silas had a Macedonian vision. Well, Paul did. And uh, the vision said, come over and help us. And so he went to uh, Philippi, the leading district of Macedonia, and he began to minister there. And he had trouble with this slave girl who had a demon spirit inside of her, a a spirit of divination. And she was making a bunch of money for her her masters because she could, uh, she was a fortune teller and and she had this spirit in her. And so people would pay her to tell their fortune. Well, she was bothering Paul because she said, these men are declaring a way of salvation. And Paul was perturbed with that. He didn't want to have advertisement from the devil in his crowd. So he cast the devil out of her. And uh, then the scripture says, when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone because the demonic spirit that was giving her wisdom was gone, they turned on Paul and Silas and they brought them before the people of Philippi. And it says in verse uh, 22, These guys said, hey, these men are are telling us they're Jews and they're telling us to do things that are not lawful since we are Romans. And it says, and the crowd rose up together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Man, to put your feet in the stocks, first of all, just being in a a prison in Philippi in the first century would have been a horrible place. That place would be rat infested. It would be dark and dank and filthy and gross. And they're in the inner prison and their feet are fastened in the stocks. The stocks would have spread your feet out like this and contorted your body. And how, how, do, you, how do you sleep in that kind of situation? Their backs are bleeding from being beaten earlier. And it says, and about midnight, but about midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening, listening to them. They're praying. Well, that's understandable. You're hurting, you're in prison, and things are bad. Yeah, you call on God. When we're in the foxhole, we call on God. But they're singing hymns of praise. 
Now, if we were singing, we'd probably be singing the blues. We'd be singing, nobody knows <laughs> the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. I mean, it's just bad for me. But they're not singing the blues. They're singing the praises of the king, hymns of praise. And it says in verse 26, and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer had been roused out of sleep and had seen the prison doors open, what did he do? He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Well, why would he do that? Because when you were a jailer, you had charge over those prisoners and if they escaped, you paid with your life. And so the jailer said, well, I'm gonna be, they, the doors are open, surely everybody is gone, and I'm going to have to stand before the magistrates and be humiliated and be executed. Why don't I save myself the humiliation and just execute myself? I'll just commit suicide now so I don't have to stand there and, and receive all the ridicule and have my family be ridiculed because I'm a crummy jailer. And in verse 28, it says, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Now I've never been a occupant in the prison or in jail. I've been to jails and I've been to the prison to visit people before, but I've never been in there. But I know from being, uh, watching enough television to know if all of a sudden at, at Sing Sing, the doors all open up and the chains are all uh, gone and, and fall to the ground, man, there's jailbreak. There's, people aren't hanging around. They're getting out of there. And Paul said, we're all still here. In verse 29, and he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. This is a hardened Roman, uh, Philippian jailer of Roman descent. And after he brought him out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? I want you to look with me at that verse and that little word, do. What must I do to be saved? Because that's what people are talking about and have been talking about since Cain and Abel, what do I have to do? We think in terms of do. And so the Philippian jailer says to Paul, it's like, what do I have to do? I mean, I don't know a lot about you Jews. What do I have to do? Do I have to get circumcised? Will, will I be saved if I get circumcised? Do I have to get baptized? Do I have to join the church? Do I have to start coming on Wednesday night? Do, do I, what do I do? Do I have to come to membership class? What do I do? Will I have to follow the law of Moses? Tell me, what must I do to be saved? People think, most people, billions and billions of people, the majority of people, they think that salvation is in the merit of man. Something that you do. Some way, somehow, you have to do something because if you don't do it, you don't make it. So what must I do to be saved? Now, why do we think like that as human beings that salvation is something that you do, that salvation somehow rests on you and what you do? Not on Jesus and what he did, but on you and what you do. Let me give you three reasons why we think that way. Number one, Salvation by works seems right to the human heart. It just seems, seems right. It seems like, well, yeah, that's the way it should be. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, and again in Proverbs 16, 25, it's a good verse to memorize because you memorize two verses at once. It's in uh, both of those references. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right, and salvation by your good works seems right. But how does it end up? Its end is the way of death. Now, all of us as human beings, we are given by God a sense of justice. There's just within us this sense of justice. And here is how the sense of justice works. Bad people should be punished, and good people should be rewarded. I mean, that's just justice, right? Bad people should be punished. Good people should be rewarded. You know, we don't like to watch 
movies and TV shows where the bad guy gets rewarded, where the bad guy gets away with it. Now we can watch that if it's just for a time that he gets away with it, but we don't wanna see him get away with it for the whole, the whole show. And then at the end of the show, evil wins and the bad and the wicked triumph. No, there's a sense in us where good needs to win. When I was uh, in high school and college, there was a popular movie character that I liked to watch. His name was Dirty Harry Callahan. Anybody watch Dirty Harry Callahan? I mean, he's great. Uh, Dirty Harry was just like, he wasn't gonna put up with any shenanigans. And he had some famous lines. Go ahead, make my day. I mean, he was just ready to blow away the bad guys. You feeling lucky, punk? You know, that was Dirty Harry. We loved him, why? Because it, it was like, yes, the good guy needs to win, the bad guy needs to lose. Bad people need to be punished and good people need to be rewarded. That's just how we think. Now, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. But here's the problem that we, the disconnect. See, we think we are good people who occasionally do some bad things. But here's the reality. There is none righteous, not even one. I remember talking to a family member and she was talking to me about her husband. Her husband was Jewish, wasn't a believer in Jesus. And I talked to her about his soul. And she said, well, Jeff, I just believe that heaven is a place for all good people. I said, but there are no good people. There are no good people. See, that's what we don't realize. God says, if you're gonna get into heaven, you must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. That's what Jesus said. So heaven is a perfect place for not just good people, perfect people. And there are no perfect people because there's none righteous, not even one, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so, yes, uh, good people should be rewarded, but there are no good people, and bad people should be punished. And hey, now you're starting to get it because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are under the judgment of God. Why? Because all have sinned, and we're in trouble. And that's why Isaiah, we sang about a little piece of scripture, I am undone. Here in your presence, I am undone. That comes from Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah said, woe is me for I am undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And man, when I saw the King, I saw myself and I said, I'm in trouble. Why? Because I'm a sinner before holy God. Hey, we don't see that part. There's a way that seems right to a man and it seems right to us that we could be good enough to somehow get to heaven because we're not bad people. Second reason why we believe this, this lie of all lies that you can get to heaven by your good works in some or in part by your good works. Second reason is salvation by works appeals to our pride and our sinful nature. I mean, we like to think that we can do it. I mean, somehow, some way, I can grit my teeth, I can grind this out, I can pull myself up by my bootstraps, I can earn this thing called salvation if I just try hard enough. We think like that. See, the Bible makes it crystal clear. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Say that with me. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. Now, if you could be saved by your good works, if I could be saved by my good works, praise the Lord. If, I, if that could happen, well then, Heaven would be a place for a bunch of peacocks. We'd just be strutting around saying, man, I got me here because of the way I live, because of my good works, that's why I'm in heaven. But it's not as a result of works, why? So that no one can boast because no one deserves to go to heaven for it's by grace through faith that you are saved. Now, salvation by works, if you believe that, it is something that will inflate your ego because you, you say, well, look at me. Look what I did. 
I, I made it. I did it. You just follow after me because I know the way to go and I know how to get there and I know how in that scale that God has of good works and bad works, I know how to tip the scales in the favor of good works so I can hear the bell go off, ding, ding, ding. What do we have for him, Johnny? He gets to go into heaven. That's what people think. That's what the Pharisees thought. And they were full of rotten pride. God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. But salvation by works is something that will inflate the, the ego. And your sinful flesh loves to have your ego inflated. Why? Because sinful flesh is all about the big eye. It's all about pride. Hey, what, life is all about me. I want what I want when I want it. It's just selfishness. It's just self-centeredness. That is sin. The middle letter of the word sin is I. And sin is all about the big eye. It's about what do I get out of the deal? The counterpoint to that is salvation by grace. What does that do? That humbles the human soul. Humbles the human soul. And we don't like to be humbled in our sinful nature. The, the flesh doesn't want to be humbled. The flesh never orders at the restaurant a big piece of humble pie because we don't like to eat humble pie. We don't like to eat crow. We don't like to say that I couldn't do it. I'm not enough, I'm not able. I love the story Jesus told in Luke chapter 18. And he told it, the scripture said, because there were some there, the religious leaders, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed other, viewed other people with contempt. And he said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and one was a tax collector. He said, the Pharisee prayed thus to himself and said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people, not like a swindler, not like an adulterer, not like this tax collector over here. Why, I pay tithes on all that I have. I fast twice a week. What a good boy am I. You ought to be really glad that I'm talking to you, Lord. You ought to be so glad that you have me as a follower. And here is the tax collector. Jesus said he wouldn't even lift up his eyes. He was just there beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. The sinner. And Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. That tax collector went home justified, and that Pharisee just went home. Why? Because the tax collector understood there's none righteous, not even one. He understood that he didn't deserve anything. And he was crying out for the mercy of God. Hey, why do people believe that you're saved by your good works? Well, it seems right to the human heart. It appeals to our pride and sinful nature. And then reason number three, salvation by works seems to be taught in parts of the Bible. See, some people will go to the Bible and say, say this is, and they, they will say, this is why I believe in salvation by works, and doubtless they go to the book of James. You know, Martin Luther, the monk of the 14 and 1500s, he was the one who started the Protestant Reformation. He was the one who tried so hard by his good works to, to please God. He would sleep in freezing cold conditions without a blanket. He would take a whip and beat himself on his back trying to, to earn God's favor. Martin Luther was the one who said this. He said that if heaven could be earned by being a good monk, then he would have earned heaven. But he realized you can't earn heaven. And he came across one day, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, but the righteous man, uh, the just man shall live by faith. And all of a sudden, Martin Luther, the light went off, and he's like, it's not about works. It's not about me trying. It's about me trusting in the Lord. Well, it totally changed his life. But now Martin Luther, although he was a brilliant man, he had trouble with the book of James because he said James seems to contradict Paul because James says in James chapter 2, verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Faith without works is dead, being by itself. And Martin Luther's like, that's not right. That's not right. But it is right. And here's where he missed it. See, it is faith alone that saves. But faith alone 
is never faith alone. It always has works. So faith alone saves you, but the faith alone is never alone because when it's true faith, it's always accompanied by works. So true saving faith is never without authenticating works. James chapter two, verse 18. He says, you show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. And so faith, a good way to think about it, faith is the root of salvation and works are the fruit of salvation. Works don't produce salvation. Salvation produces works. Do you see the difference? And that's where people get confused. Now, I want us to go back to Ephesians chapter two and put on the screen. I want you to notice something with me. The scripture says, for by grace. Now, notice that's in bold. By grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now notice with me three words. Three words will keep your theology straight. First word is the little preposition by. How are we saved? We're saved by grace. Second preposition, through, through faith. By grace, through faith. Now think of it like this. Grace is like electricity. It's grace is God's favor, God's uh, riches at Christ's expense, God's love in action. It's the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. You don't deserve grace, you don't earn grace, but God gives it anyway by, by grace. It's like electricity that comes to your house. Now, if you don't have electricity at your house, you can't run any appliance because there's no electricity. But you can have electricity at your house and if you don't plug in your appliances, they don't work. We, have, we keep our toaster in a cabinet. And uh, when we use the toaster, we pull it out of the cabinet, we put it on the counter, and we plug it in. You know, if I put my toast in the toaster when it's in the cabinet, not plugged in, I don't get toast. It doesn't work. The toaster only comes to life when I plug it in. Grace is electricity. Faith is when we plug into the electricity. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that anyone should boast. And then it says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're saved by grace through faith for good works. We're not saved by good works, we're saved for good works. God has good works that he wants us to do. And here's the acid test of Christianity. Have you been changed? If you're the same old, mean, bitter, nasty person that you've always been, and you say, well, uh, I got saved, and I got baptized, and I am no different. Let me tell you something. You didn't get saved. You didn't get saved, because when you get saved, you get changed. And there are good works that start, people notice, they recognize that you have been with Jesus. Something has changed within you. Your countenance, your, your attitude, everything is different now. You show me your faith without the works, James says, and I'll show you my faith by my works because faith without works is dead being by itself. Salvation is the root and works or, or faith, how did I word it? Uh, faith is the root and works are the fruit. So it doesn't have anything to do with your works. It doesn't have anything to do with my works. But it has everything to do with his work. It has everything to do with his work. And that brings me to point number four. Salvation is by his work through the cross and the empty tomb. So here's this Philippian jailer. He bows at the feet of Paul and Silas and he's full of fear and trembling. And no doubt the presence of God is in that place because nobody left. They couldn't leave. I think they were just gripped with fear in the presence of God. This was an isolated earthquake. It just hit the prison house, didn't hit anywhere else. This is a unique earthquake because earthquakes normally don't shake your bonds free on your handcuffs, but this did. And so they knew they were in the presence of God. And this Philippian jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Tell me what I need to do. And their answer, 
believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 31, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized. See, there is fruit there. You can tell something's changed in him. He's washing their wounds. He's, he's uh, uh, giving them acts of love and hospitality. He was baptized. He followed the Lord in baptism. You're not saved by baptism. When you are saved, then you get baptized. And that was what he did in verse 34. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Salvation is his work that he did on the cross and through the empty tomb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a, crim left a crimson stain that I couldn't get rid of, but he washed it white as snow. So that's what they, what do you need to do? You don't need to do anything. You need to believe. Now do is an act, believe is faith. That's different. When you say, what do I have to do? That's, you know, in Islam, what do you have to do? Well, you have to follow the five pillars of Islam. In Buddhism, what do I have to do? Well, you have to follow the eightfold path of Buddhism. Every other uh, religion, whether it's a false religion or a false cult, what they'll tell you is you gotta do something. Here's a list of things you have to do. Christianity is different than all of them because Christianity says it's not spelled D-O, it's spelled D-O-N-E, he did it. So Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe, commit yourself to him, trust him. Now believe what about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, believe who he is, who he is. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is Jesus Christ? As Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus in John chapter nine healed that man that was born blind. And then the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders began to question that man. And they put the screws to that man. And when that man said, well, this Jesus, he did it. Then they threw him out of the synagogue and Jesus found him later. And he said, do you believe in the son of man? And that blind man who could now see said, tell me who he is, Lord, and I'll believe in him. And Jesus said, you have seen him and he is the one who is speaking to you. And that man said, Lord, I believed. And he worshiped him. He worshiped him. Listen, Jews knew you didn't worship a man. You worship God and you worship God only. And he worshiped Jesus. Why? Because Jesus Christ is God. That is why. You have to understand that. See, that knocks out every false cult because every false cult has the same uh, DNA. They reject the deity of Christ. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, and that blows our minds because how could someone be fully God and fully man, but he is, and he is co-equal with God the Father. So you believe who he is, and then you believe on what he has done. And no doubt Paul told this Philippian jailer and his family, see, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your household. Now, this man couldn't make the decision for his household, just like I can't make the decision for my household. You can't make the decision for your household. They, the, Paul preached to the man and his family and they all believed. And they all were rejoicing in verse 34 because they had believed in God. And this man had believed in God with his whole family. So he told them about who Jesus was and he told them about the cross and the empty tomb and we know that he did that. It says in verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. The word of the Lord. Paul told the Corinthians, he said, I delivered to you as of first importance the gospel which I preached to you. What is the gospel? That Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. It's his death, it's his burial, it's his resurrection. 
People say there's no difference in Christianity. All religions are the same. Baloney. I like what Ravi Zacharias said. He said, all religions are superficially the same and they're fundamentally different. John Lennox, the professor at, I think he's at Oxford in England. He said, you know, you take the three monotheistic religions of the world. He said, Islam. Islam with 25% of the population are uh, adherents to Islam. He said, Islam said Jesus never died. He never died on the cross. I mean, he died, but he didn't die on the cross. The Jews say, well, Jesus died on the cross, but he never rose. Now, both Islam and Judaism, they reject that Jesus Christ is God. I mean, Islam especially, God has no son. Allah has no son. So Jesus Christ is not God. And the Jews would echo that, say, no, he's not God. And he died on the cross, but he didn't rise again from the dead. Christianity said Jesus is God. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and Jesus rose again from the dead. And Jesus Christ is the only founder of a faith who died and rose again. The founder of Islam is Muhammad, he's dead. The founder of Buddhism is Gautama Buddha, he's dead. Jesus is alive forevermore and he says, follow me and you can follow a man who is alive and he has the keys of death and of hell. So he preached the gospel to him and this man believed. And you know the big thing about Christianity? Obviously the empty tomb is the thing that sets Christianity apart from everything else. But you know the other thing that sets Christianity apart from everything else is the fact that you can know today that you are forgiven that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You can know that you know that you know that you know that when you die, you'll be in heaven with Jesus. No other religion will tell you that. They say, well, we don't know. You don't know. I mean, you work and you work and you work and then you hope, but nobody has the assurance in Islam, they say, well, you know, uh, it's just based on the mercy of Allah and we don't know what he's gonna do. So we work and we work and we work and we hope that when we die that he'll let us into heaven. I had a friend of mine, he was Catholic and uh, I was talking to a, a person at the laundromat. This is when I was in college and I was witnessing this guy and I said, hey, do you know for sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven? And he said, no, I don't. And he said, and furthermore, you don't either. I said, oh, I don't. He said, no. He said, nobody can know that. That's only what you find out when you die. And when you die, you find out, did I make it or did I not make it? See, he was into the works of salvation. And I said, well, you know, John the apostle said that you could know. Because the scripture says, he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And you can know today that you have eternal life. You don't have to guess. You don't have to hope so, maybe so, guess so. You can know and you can know today if you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll close with this story. We all know about the Titanic sinking in 1912. Well, about four years after the Titanic sunk, there was a young Scotsman who was in a church service in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. He had survived the sinking of the Titanic. He had been pulled from the sea. He was giving a testimony. Now on that ship, there was a godly pastor who was traveling to Chicago to minister at Moody Church in Chicago. His name was John Harper. He was from Scotland. Godly man, he was there with his daughter and with his sister. They were going to Chicago. He was, when that ship started going down, he began to witness to everybody he could. He made sure that the women and children got on the, the boats and then the ship went down and he was there with his life vest. And this was the testimony of this man, Aguila Webb. His testimony was this, I was John Harper's last convert. Here were his words. I'm a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a piece of wreckage that awful night, the tide brought Mr. John Harper of Glasgow, a godly pastor and soul winner, also on a piece of wreckage near me. Man, he said, are you saved? 
No, I said, I'm not. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should be saved. He said the waves took him away, but strange, they brought him back a short time later. And he said, are you saved now? He said, no, I can't honestly say that I am. And Harper said to him again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. And shortly after he went down and Webb said, there alone in the night and with two miles of ocean underneath me, I believed and I was saved. Listen, you can believe today if you've never believed before you can believe completely and totally in Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation. It's not dependent on baptism. It's not dependent on church membership. It's not dependent on you being good. It's dependent on what he did when he died for you and rose again from the dead. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. We've been talking about fake news today. We've been exposing the lies of the devil and as we close out this message, we want to focus on the truth that God really does love you. Jesus really did die for you, and you can be forgiven and changed if you want to be. So if that's your desire, pray this simple prayer with me. Just say from your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe Jesus that you are God in the flesh that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead on the third day. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my life, my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real